So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manon Lager. I'm a PhD student at the Laboratoire d'Océanologie de Géosciences in France. And today, I will present our research title, Elemental Mass of Modern Rizaria from Cellular Scale to Global Biogeochemical Cycles. First of all, to put a bit of context, in this talk, I will focus um, mainly on two groups of planktonic rizaria. So, Radioloria polycystinea and Fiodaria. So Fiodaria were first classified within Radiolaria, but then they were moved within Cercozoa on the basis of DNA analysis. And so most of the species from these groups, as you know, can produce silica skeletons, but there is an important difference in the structure of the skeleton, which is porous and less silica dense for Fiodaria than for Radiolaria. So these taxa are highly diversified. First of all, they occupy a broad size spectrum, which ranges from a few micrometers for the smallest radiolaria to several millimeters for Fiodaria and Colodaria. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on large rizaria whose size is above 200 micrometers. So this size spectrum varies with depth because indeed, uh, in modern oceans, rizaria inhabit a wide range of vertical habitats. So they have a, di a different ecology and they have a diversity of trophic functions. On one hand, uh, the surface populations, which are mostly radiolaria, can harbor algal symbionts and so be mixotrophic. And on the other hand, the deep living populations, mostly fiodaria, are strictly heterotrophic and they feed on sinking marine snow. So because living rizaria are fragile organisms, it was difficult in the past to assess their contribution to oceanic biomass. But now from in-situ imaging techniques, which are non-destructive for these organisms, it was shown that at global scale, large rizaria can account for about 30% of mesozooplankton biomass. And individually, Siliceous rhizoria are the most silicified pelagic organisms. So this means that they have the highest silica content per unit volume. And so with this high silica content, they can contribute substantially to the vertical fluxes of uh, organic matter, of organic carbon and biogenic silica. So for example, radiolaria are associated to large carbon pulses and large fiodian particles can be important exporter, exporters of organic carbon in, in the mesopelagic zone because of their ballasting effect. But still, this contribution is poorly constrained because we do not really have reliable volume to biomass conversion factors. And a way to convert uh, the size to elemental mass is to use allometric relationships because they link simple morphological traits such as the size, so to uh, functional traits such as the mass. And the, the benefit of allometries is that we can implement them in models so we can use them at a larger scale, like at the population scale. So allometric relationships linking the carbon content to the size were um, established previously for various proteins such as diatoms and dinoflagellates in the Keystone paper, Mendendeuer and Nessart. But in this paper, rizaria are absent. And these relationships are believed to overestimate the carbon biomass of large proteins. Conversely, an allometric relationship uh, linking the biogenic silica content to the size was established for, for rizaria. And this relationship <coughs> covers a large size spectrum and multiple taxa. So if we come back to the carbon, up to now, three studies directly measured the carbon and nitrogen contents of rhizaria, but they are limited to a few taxa and a few samples. And especially we have a disparity between the different taxa. For example, we have much more data today for colodaria than for the other, the other radiolaria. And thus, we still do not have uh, 
an accurate and simple way to estimate the biomass at a larger scale. Uh, so the questions for this talk are, first of all, do carbon and nitrogen contents relate to the size for a broad diversity of rhizaria? And then from the results, can we learn more about the resilient ecology? And finally, we will see what are the distribution patterns of the biomass at global scale. To answer the first question, we collected re resilient specimen in 2021 in the California current. So we collected them in various, various environmental conditions down to the mesopelagic and we used uh, nettos. Then we isolated uh, and pulled together several specimens belonging to the same taxa. And for each individual, we took pictures so we could get the size measurements. We, we then fil filtered the, pool, the pools of individuals and we analyzed the filters through a CNN analyzer. And we also kept a few samples to assess the biogenic silica production. But as we did not find any significant link between this and the size, uh, in this talk, I will only focus on the carbon and nitrogen contents. So we collected more than 2,000 specimens belonging to the radiolarian order Scolodaria. We also found a photosymbiotic nacellaria, individuals of the newly defined order Orodaria, and Spumelaria, and uh, also specimens belonging to many Feodarian families. So these specimens range in size from 200 micrometers to several millimeters. And they were pulled together. So in the end, we get 153 samples. And to these samples, we added 103 samples from literature data. Then we tested for the relationship between the size and the elemental content. And we found that over our entire size spectrum, the carbon and nitrogen content relate well to the cell size. And what we see, if, you, if we look at the R square, uh, it is pretty high. So this means that the size can explain much of the variability in the elemental composition. And then we compare the slope of the carbon to size relationship to the one that was uh, found previously by Mendendur and Lessard for various protists. And we found that this, uh, the slope for Rizaria was, was significantly lower. So this means that for the same increase in size, the carbon content will increase less than for other protists. And what we notice is that very quickly, this, this previous relationship would give an overestimation of the carbon content of planktonic Rizaria. So could this imply that Rizaria have a low carbon strategy and especially the large ones? So if we, if we look closer at the carbon densities for each of the sample taxa, we see that uh, the densities vary over four orders of magnitude. And from that, from that, can we learn about the ecology? So we can first hypothesize that this is a strategy to live in a food depleted environment. Because you can see that the photosymbiotic species uh, which live in oligotrophic waters are amongst the lowest carbon densities. So this could allow them to increase their size and to have more algal symbionts. And also, the deep living taxa, so mostly Fiodaria, also have a low carbon density. So we know that to feed, they rely on the material, the sinking from the surface. And for them, a way to increase their interception area is to increase their size. So having a low carbon density could be a compensation for an increased size, and so allow them to live in the food depleted mesopelagic layer. Uh, what would a low carbon strategy be of further interest for Rizaya? We can also hypothesize that this is a strategy to make the cell less nutritious and thus less attractive to potential predators. 
And also, as I said before, rhizoria are the most silicified pelagic organisms. So we can also hypothesize that this low carbon density could help them to maintain neutral buoyancy in spite of the skeleton weight. Because it was shown that some taxa have a very limited depth range, so this could prevent them to sink out of this range. Now we can further ex explore their role in the ecosystem by investigating how they contribute to the fluxes of carbon and silica. So now we are able to get the, the silica, the carbon, and the nitrogen contents for many resilient taxa. And from that, we can calculate the theoretical sinking speeds according to Stokes' law. And when we did this calculation, we observed a large variability among the taxa, and we could distinguish two groups, uh, high sinking speeds and low to moderate sinking speeds. So first of all, we noticed that Spumularia and Orodaria have a much greater sinking speed, theoretical sinking speed, than um, the Fiodarian of equivalent size. So this could be because of the difference in the skeletal structure that is also less likely to dissolve along the way for the Radiolaria. But we also found that some Fiodarian families that are more silica dense also have a great, a great theoretical sinking speed. So all these taxa could be uh, efficient exporters of organic carbon and biogenic silica to the deep ocean upon their depth. And on the other hand, um, the delicate skeletons of this taxa uh, will probably entirely dissolve on the way down to the seafloor and will never reach it. So now we saw that the carbon and nitrogen contents can be related to the cell size, and this gave us clues about the ecology of Rizaria. And now I'm going to show how we can use these equations to estimate the biomass at a global scale. So as I said before, Rizaria are fragile organisms, but we can sample the large ones using in situ imaging. Like the, the, the UVP5 camera, which gets vertical profiles of the abundance of particles. And this camera saves the images of the large particles, so over 600 micrometers. And so we can identify these particles. And for the Rizaria, we have more than 30 different morphotypes that we can assign to specific taxa. So these are mostly Fiodaria, and we have almost no polycystins. And from the images, so uh, for one, one specimen, we can get a size me measurement. So this means that we can apply our allometric relationships. So in 2016, a first global Rizarian biomass assessment was made with about 36,000 Rizarian specimens. And now this data set is much larger with up to five times more specimens, and it includes many more profiles in previously undersampled areas, such as uh, the high latitudes, the Pacific, and the upwelling areas. So this data set is dominated by two Fiodarian families, Olacantidae and Olosferidae, both with a silicified test. And they are followed by the Radiolarian, Acantaria, and Colodaria. So the depth of the different profiles vary among the cruises, but most of the profiles uh, will allow to estimate the biomass down to the mesopelagic layer. So this is why the data set was divided into two layers, epipelagic and mesopelagic, to, to distinguish two different ecologies. And so to model the global biomass, each profile can be associated to global gridded environmental variables, such as temperature. And then a boosted regression tree is built to model the relationship between the biomass and the environmental variables. And then this boosted regression tree is used with the environmental variables, so to give uh, the predicted biomass for all the points of the grid. 
So this is the global map of the predicted biogenic silica concentration in the epipelagic layer for only for Feodaria. So we can see from this model that the biomass is mostly distributed in the productive areas, such as the high latitudes and the upwelling areas. And this biomass is low in the subtropical dryers. So, and if we look at the values, we see that the average um, con silica concentration is about 100 microgram of silica per cubic meters. And now this is the global map of the predicted field iron biomass, field iron silica biomass in the mesopelagic layer. So where well, large field iron are abundant. So first we see that the patterns are the same than in the epipelagic. And, but if you pay attention to the scale, you see that again, the mean value is about 100 microgram of silica per cubic meters. So what is the most striking from these two maps is that the biomass in the epipelagic layer is equivalent to the mass in the mesopelagic layer, but where the diatoms are absent. And finally, the same global maps were made uh, in a recent paper uh, with the carbon, to, so to predict the carbon biomass but it was done with, with a different data set and without the new allometries. So from the two maps of the predicted collodion carbon biomass and the predicted ferrodion carbon biomass, we observe uh, major discrepancies in the, in the distribution of the two taxa. So ferrodion are present at, in the productive areas in the high and low latitudes and collodion are present in the oligotrophic dryers. So now we can also wonder how, this, how, how these maps would change with the extended data set and if we used the new allometries. So now as a perspective, uh, from the global biomass, we then want to know how much of it is exported to the deep ocean. And from now we can have all the parameters, so to estimate the fluxes over the entire size spectrum. So we can estimate the mass using the allometries, the speed use, using the elemental content data, and the concentration using modeling. But as we saw before, probably not all resoria will contribute the same way to the vertical fluxes. And we still need information about how remineralization and dissolution would affect this vertical export. And finally, a few take home messages. So we saw that now from size measurements, we can estimate the carbon and nitrogen uh, resilient biomass with a higher accuracy. Uh, this, these results gave us a few clues about the ecology of resilient, and we saw that they are less carbon dense than other protists. And finally, at global scale, large, um, we, we observed a large silica biomass in the mesopelagic layer as, where diatoms are absent. And we also observed distinct patterns of distribution between Feodaria and Colodaria. So to finish, I'd like to thank the people who worked on this project and the, the funders of this project, and as well as the CC LTR program who allowed the sampling. And thank you also for your attention.